Chapter 4 The Man Who Felt Queer This time the wolf was prowling round outside the sheepfold. His Majesty's frigate, indefatigable, had chased the French corvette Papillon into the mouth of the Gironde, and was seeking a way of attacking her where she lay at anchor in the stream under the protection of the batteries at the mouth. Captain Pellew took his ship into shoal water as far as he dared, until in fact the batteries fired warning shots to make him keep his distance, and he stared long and keenly through his glass at the corvette. Then he shut his telescope, and turned on his heel to give the order that worked the indefatigable away from the dangerous lee shore. Out of sight of land, in fact. His departure might lull the French into a, into a sense of security, which, he hoped, would prove unjustified, for he had no intention of leaving them undisturbed. If the corvette could be captured or sunk, not only would she be unavailable for raids on British commerce, but also the French would be forced to increase their coastal defences at this point, and lessen the efforts that could be put out elsewhere. War is a matter of savage blow and counter-blow, and even a forty-gun frigate could strike shrewd blows if shrewdly handled. Midshipman Hornblower was walking the lee side of the quarter-deck, as became his lowly station as the junior officer of the watch. In the afternoon, when Midshipman Kennedy approached him, Kennedy took off his hat with a flourish and bowed low as his dancing master had once taught him, left foot advanced, hat down by the right knee. Hornblower entered into the spirit of the game, laid his hat against his stomach, and bent himself in the middle three times in quick succession. Thanks to his physical awkwardness, he could parody ceremonial solemnity without even trying. Most grave and revered, Signor, said Kennedy, I bear the compliments of Sir Edward Pellew, who humbly solicits your gravity's attentions at dinner at eight bells in the afternoon watch. My respects to Sir Edward, replied Hornblower bowing to his knees at the mention of the name, and I shall condescend to make a brief appearance. I am sure the captain will be both relieved and delighted in equal measure, said Kennedy. I will convey my felicitations along with your most flattering acceptance. Both hats flourished with even greater elaboration than before, but at that moment both young men noticed Mr. Bolton, the officer of the watch, looking at them from the windward side, and they hurriedly put their hats on and assumed attitudes more consonant with the dignity of officers holding their warrants from King George. "'What's in the captain's mind?' asked Hornblower. Kennedy laid one finger alongside his nose. "'If I knew that, I should rate a couple of epaulets,' he said. "'Something's brewing, and I suppose one of these days we shall know what it is.' Until then, all that we little victims can do is to play unconscious of our doom. Meanwhile, be careful not to let the ship fall overboard. There was no sign of anything brewing while dinner was being eaten in the great cabin of the indefatigable. Pelly was a courtly host at the head of the table. Conversation flowed freely and along in different channels among the senior officers present. The two lieutenants, Eccles and Chad, and the sailing master, Soames. Hornblower and the other junior officer, Mallory, a midshipman of over two years' seniority, kept silent, as midshipmen should, thereby being able to devote their undivided attention to the food, so vastly superior to what was served in the midshipman's berth. "'A glass of wine with you, Mr. Hornblower,' said Pellew, raising his glass. Hornblower tried to bow gracefully in his seat while raising his glass. He sipped cautiously, for he had early found that he had a weak head, and he disliked feeling drunk. The table was cleared, and there was a brief moment of expectancy as the company awaited Pellew's next move. "'Now, Mr. Soames,' said Pellew, "'let us have that chart.' It was a map of the mouth of the Gironde, with the surroundings. Somebody had pencilled in the positions of the shore batteries. "'The Papillon,' said Sir Edward. He did not condescend to pronounce it in French fashion. Uh, "'Lies just here.' Mr. Soames took the bearings. He indicated a pencilled cross on the chart, far up the channel. You gentlemen, went on Pellew, are going in with the boats to fetch her out. So that was it. A cutting out expedition. Mr. Eccles will be in general command. I will ask him to tell you his plan. The grey-haired first lieutenant, with the surprisingly young blue eyes, looked round at the others. I shall have the launch, he said, and Mr. Soames the cutter. Mr. Chad and Mr. Mallory will command the first and second gigs, and Mr. Hornblower will command the jolly boat. Each of the, of the boats, except Mr. Hornblower's, will have a junior officer second in command. It would not be necessary for the jolly boat with its crew of seven. The launch and cutter would carry from thirty to forty men each, and the gigs twenty each. It was a large force that was being dispatched, nearly half the ship's company. 
She's a ship of war, explained Eccles, reading their thoughts. No merchantmen. Ten guns aside and full of men. Nearer two hundred men than a hundred, certainly. Plentiful opposition for a hundred and twenty British seamen. But we'll be attacking her by night and taking her by surprise, said Eccles, reading their thoughts again. Surprise, put in Pellew, is more than half the battle, as you know, gentlemen. Please pardon the interruption, Mr. Eccles. At the moment, went on Eccles, we are out of sight of land. We are about to stand in again. We have never hung about this part of the coast, and the frogs will think we've gone for good. We'll make land after nightfall, stand in as far as possible, and then the boats will go in. High water tomorrow is at 4.30, dawn is at 5.30. The attack will be delivered at 4.30, so that the watch below will have had time to get to sleep. The launch will attack on the starboard quarter, and the cutter on the larboard quarter. Mr. Mallory's gig will attack on the larboard bow, and Mr. Chad's on the starboard bow. Mr. Chad will be responsible for cutting the corvette's cable as soon as he has mastered the foxhole and the other boat's crews have at least reached the quarter-deck. Eccles looked round at the other three commanders of the large boats, and they nodded in understanding. Then he went on. Mr. Hornblower with the jolly boat will wait until the attack has gained a foothold on the deck. He will then board the main chains, either to starboard or larboard as he sees fit, and he will at once ascend the main rigging, paying no attention to whatever fighting is going on on deck. He will see to it that the main topsail is loosed, and he will sheet it home on receipt of further orders. <clears throat> I myself, or Mr. S or Mr. Soames, in the event of my being killed or wounded, will send two hands to the wheel and will attend to steering the corvette out as soon as she is underway. The tide will take us out, and the indefatigable will be waiting for us just out of gunshot range from the shore batteries. Any comments, gentlemen? asked Pellew. <clears throat> this was the moment when Hornblower should have spoken up. The only moment, in fact, when he could. Eccles' orders had set in motion sick feelings of apprehension in his stomach. Hornblower was no main topman, and Hornblower knew it. He hated heights, and he hated going aloft. He knew he had none of the monkey-like agility and self-confidence of a good seaman. He was unsure of himself aloft in the dark, even in the indefatigable, and he was utterly appalled at the thought of going aloft on an entirely strange ship and finding his way among strange rigging. He felt himself quite unfitted for the duty assigned to him, and he should have raised a protest at once on account of his unfitness. But he let the opportunity pass, for he was overcome by the matter-of-fact way in which the other officers had accepted the plan. He looked round at the unmoved faces. Nobody was paying any attention to him, and he jibed at making himself conspicuous. He swallowed. He even got as far as opening his mouth, but still no one looked at him and his protest died stillborn. Very well then, gentlemen, said Pellew. I think you'd better go to the details, Mr. Eccles. Then it was too late. Eccles, with the chart before him, was pointing out the course to be taken through the shoals and mud banks of the Gironde, and, expa and expatiating on the position of the shore batteries, and on the influence of the lighthouse of Cordan upon the distance to which the indefatigable could approach in daylight. Hornblower listened trying to concentrate despite his apprehensions. Eccles finished his remarks, and Pellew closed the meeting. Since you know your duties, den gentlemen, I think you should start your preparations. The sun is about to set, and you will find that you have plenty to do. The bow's crews had to be told off. It was necessary to see that the men were armed, and that the boats were provisioned in case of emergency. Every man had to be instructed in the duties expected of him and Hornblower had to, had to rehearse himself in ascending the main shrouds and laying out along the main topsail yard. He did it twice, forcing himself to make the difficult climb up the frottock shrouds, which projecting outwards from the mainmast made it necessary to climb several feet while hanging back downwards, locking fingers and toes into the ratlins. He could just manage it, moving slowly and carefully, albeit clumsily. He stood on the foot rope and worked his way out to the yard arm. The foot rope was attached along the yard so as to hang neatly four feet below it. The principal was to set his feet on the rope with his arms over the yard, then, holding the yard to, to his armpits, to shuffle sideways along the foot rope to cast off the gaskets and loose the sail. Twice Hornblower made the whole journey, battling with the disquiet of his stomach at the thought of the hundred foot drop below him. Finally, gulping with nervousness, he transferred his grip to the brace and forced himself to slide it down to the deck. That would be his best route when the time came to sheet the topsail home. It was a long and perilous descent, Hornblower told, told himself, as indeed he had said to himself when he had first seen men go aloft, that similar feats in a circus at home would be received by whoos and ahs of appreciation. 
he was by no means satisfied with himself. Even when he reached the deck, and at the back of his mind was a vivid mental picture of his missing his hold when the time came for him to repeat the performance in the papillon, and falling headlong to the deck. A second or two of frightful fear while rushing through the air, and then a shattering crash. And the success of the attack, attack hinged on him, as much as on anybody else. If the topsail was not promptly set to give the corvette steerage way, she would run aground on one of the innumerable shoals in the river mouth to be ignominiously recaptured, and half the crew of the indefatigable would either be dead or be prisoners. In the waist, the jolly boat's crew was formed up for his inspection. He, he saw to it that the oars were properly muffled, that each man had a pistol and cutlass, and made sure that every pistol was at half cock, so there was no fear of a premature shot giving warning of the attack. He allocated duties to each man in the loosening of the topsail, laying stress on the possibility that casualties might necessitate unrehearsed changes in the scheme. I will mount the rigging first, said Hornblower. That had to be the case. He had to lead. It was expected of him. And more than that, if he had given any other order, it would have excited comment and contempt. Jackson, went on Hornblower, addressing the coxswain, you will quit the boat last and take command if I fall. Aye, aye, sir. It was usual to it was usual to use the pro poetic expression fall for die, and it was only after Hornblower had uttered the word that he thought about its horrible real meaning in the present circumstances. Is that all understood? asked Hornblower harshly. It was his mental stress that made his voice great so. Everybody nodded except one man. Begging your pardon, sir, said Hales, the young man who poured the stroke oar. I'm feeling a bit queer like. Hales was a lightly built young fellow of swarthy countenance. He put his hand to his forehead with a vague gesture as he spoke. You're not the only one to feel queer, snapped Hornblower. The other men chuckled. The thought of running the gauntlet of the shore batteries of boarding an armed corvette in the teeth of opposition might well raise apprehension in the breast of a coward. Most of the men detailed for the exposition must have felt uh, some qualms to some extent. I don't mean that, sir. Of course I don't, said Hales indignantly but Hornblower and the others paid him no attention. "'You just keep your mouth shut,' growled Jackson. There could be nothing but contempt for a man who announced himself sick after being told off on a dangerous duty. Hornblower, however, felt sympathy as well as contempt. He himself had been too much of a coward even to give voice to his apprehensions, too much afraid of what people would say about him. "'Dismiss,' said Hornblower. "'I'll pass the word for all of you when you're wanted.' There were some hours yet to wait while the indefatigable crept in shore, with the lead going steadily, and Pellew himself attending the course of the frigate. Hornblower, despite his nervousness and his miserable apprehensions, yet found time to appreciate the superb seamanship displayed by Pellew as he brought the big frigate in through those tricky waters on that dark night. His interest was so caught by the procedure that the little tremblings which had been assailing him ceased to manifest themselves. Hornblower was of the type that would continue to observe and learn on his deathbed. By the time the indefatigable had reached that point off the mouth of the river where it was desired to launch the boats, Hornblower had learned a good deal about the practical application of the principles of coastwise navigation and a good deal about the organization of a cutting-out expedition, and, by self-analysis, he had learned even more about the psychology of a raiding party before a raid. He had mastered himself to all outside appearance, by the time he went on to the jolly boat as she heaved on the inky black water and he gave the command to shove off in a quiet, steady voice. Hornblower took the tiller. The feel of that solid bar of wood was reassuring and it was her old habit now to sit in the stern sheets with hand and elbow upon it and the men began to pull slowly after the dark shapes of the four big boats. There was plenty of time and the flowing tide would just take them up the estuary. That was just as well for on one side of them lay the batteries of saint -Dee, and inside the estuary, on the other side, was the fortress of Blaye. Forty big guns trained to sweep the channel, and none of the five boats, certainly not the jolly boat, could withstand a single shot from one of them. He kept his eyes attentively on the cutter ahead of him. Soames had the dreadful responsibility of taking the boats up the channel, while all he had to do was to follow in her wake. All, except, to lose that main topsail, loose that main topsail. Hornblower found himself shivering again. Hales, the man who had said he felt queer, was pulling stroke oar. Hornblower could just see his dark form moving rhythmically back and forward at each slow stroke. After a single glance, Hornblower paid him no more attention, 
and was staring after the cutter when a sudden commotion brought his mind back into the boat. Someone had missed his stroke. Someone had thrown all six oars into confusion as a result. There was even a slight clatter. Mind what you're doing there, blast you hails, whispered Jackson, the coxswain, with desperate urgency. For answer, there was a sudden cry from Hales, loud, but fortunately not too loud, and Hales pitched forward against hornblowers and Jackson's legs, kicking and writhing. The bastard's having a fit, growled Jackson. The kicking and writhing went on. Across the water, through the darkness, came a sharp, scornful whisper. Mr. Hornblower, said the voice. It was Eccles, putting a word of exasperation into his sotto voce question. Cannot you keep your men quiet? Eccles had brought the launch round almost alongside the jolly boat to say this to him. The desperate need for silence was dramatically demonstrated by the as absence of any of the usual blasphemy. Hornblower could picture the cutting reprimand that would be administered, with, administered to him tomorrow publicly on the quarter deck. He opened his mouth to make an explanation, but he fortunately realised that raiders in open boats did not make explanations when under the guns of a fortress. Aye, aye, sir, was all he whispered back. And the launch continued on its mission of shepherding the flotilla into the tracks of the cutter. Take his oar, Jackson, he whispered furiously to the coxswain. And he stooped, and with his own hands dragged the writhing figure towards him and out of Jackson's way. You might try pouring water on him, sir, said Jackson hoarsely, as he moved it afterthwart. There's a bailer there, Andy. Sea water was the seaman's cure for every ill, his panchea. And seeing how often sailors had not merely wet jackets but wet bedding as well, they should never have a day's illness. But Hornblower let the sick man lie. His struggles were coming to an end, and Hornblower wished to make no more noise with the bailer. The lives of more than a hundred men depended on silence. Now that they were well into the actual estuary, they were within easy reach of cannon shot from the shore, and a single cannon shot would rouse the crew of the Papillon, ready to man the bulwarks to beat off the attack ready to drop cannonballs into the boats alongside, ready to shatter approaching boats with a tempest of grape. Silently, the boats glided up the estuary. Soames in the cutter was setting a slow pace, with only an occasional stroke at his oar to maintain steerage way. Presumably, he knew very well what he was doing. The channel he selected was an obscure one between mudbanks, impracticable for anything except a small boats, and he had a twenty-foot pole with him with which to take the soundings quicker and much more fast than silent than using the lead. Minutes were passing fast, and yet the night was still utterly dark, with no hint of the approaching dawn. Strain his eyes as he would, Hornblower could not be sure that he could see the flat shores on either side of him. It would call for sharp eyes on the land to detect the little boat being carried up by the tide. Hales at his feet stirred, and then stirred again. His hand, feeling round in the darkness, found Hornblower's ankle, apparently examined it with curiosity. He muttered something, the words dragging out into a moan. Shut up, whispered Hornblower, trying, like the saint of old, to make a tongue of his whole body that he might express the urgency of the occasion without making a sound audible at any distance. Hales set his elbow on Hornblower's knee and levered himself up into a sitting position, and then levered himself further until he was standing, swaying with bent knees and supporting himself against Hornblower. Sit down, damn you! whispered Hornblower, shaking with fury and anxiety. "'Where's Mary?' asked Hales in a conversational tone. "'Shut up!' "'Mary!' said Hales, lurching against him. "'Mary!' Each successive word was louder. Hornblower felt instinctively that Hales would soon be speaking in a loud voice, and that he might, he might even be shouting. Old recollections of conversations with his doctor father stirred at the back of his mind. He remembered that persons emerging from epileptic fits were not responsible for their actions, and might be, and often were, dangerous. Mary! said Hales again. Victory in the lives of a hundred men depended on silencing Hales, and, instant and silencing him instantly. Hornblower thought of the pistol in his belt, and of using the butt, but there was another weapon more conveniently to his hand. He unshipped the tiller, a three-foot bar of solid oak, and he swung it with all the venom and fury of despair. The tiller crashed down on Hale's head, and Hale's, an unuttered word cut short in his throat, fell silent in the bottom of the boat. There was no sound from the boat's crew, save from something like a sigh from Jackson. Whether approving or disapproving, Hornblower neither knew nor cared. He had done his duty, and he was certain of it. He had struck down a helpless idiot, 
which most probably he had killed him, but the surprise upon which the success of the expedition depended had not been imperiled. He reshipped the tiller and resumed the silent task of keeping in the wake of the gigs. Far away in the darkness, it was impossible to estimate the distance, there was a nucleus of greater darkness, close on the surface of the black water. It might be the corvette. A dozen more silent strokes and Hornblower was sure of it. Soames had done a magnificent job of pilotage, leading the boat straight to that objective. The cutter and launch were diverging now from the two gigs. The four boats were separating in readiness to launch the simultaneous converging attack. Easy, whispered Hornblower, and the jolly boat's crew ceased to pull. Hornblower had his orders. He had to wait until the attack had gained a foothold on the deck. His hand clenched convulsively on the tiller. The excitement of dealing with Hales had driven the thought of having to ascend strange rigging in the darkness clear out of his head, and it now recurred to him with a redoubled urgency. Hornblower was afraid. Although he could see the corvette, the boats had vanished from his sight, had passed out of his field of vision. The corvette rode to her anchor, her spars just visible against the night sky. And that was where he had to climb. She seemed to tower up hugely. Close by the corvette he saw a splash in the dark water. The boats were closing in fast, and someone's stroke had been a little careless. At the same moment came a shout from the corvette's deck, and when the shout was repeated, it was echoed a hundredfold from the boats, rushing alongside. The yelling was lusty and prolonged, of set purpose. A sleeping enemy would be bewildered by the din, and the progress of the shouting would tell each, each boat's crew of the extent of the success of the others. The British seamen were yelling like madmen. A flash and a bang from the corvette's deck told of the firing of the first shot. Soon pistols were popping and muskets banging from several points of, of the deck. Give way, said Hornblower. He uttered the order as if it had been torn from him by the rack. The jolly boat moved forward, while Hornblower fought down his feelings and tried to make out what was going on on board. He could see no reason for choosing either side of the corvette in preference to the other, and the larboard side was the nearer, so he steered the boat to the larboard main chains. So interested in, was he in what he was doing that he only remembered in the nick of time to give the order. In oars! He pulled the tiller over, and the boat swirled round and the bowman hooked on. From the deck just above came a noise exactly like a tinker hammering on a cooking pot. Hornblower noticed the curious noise as he stood up in the stern sheets. He felt the cutlass at his side and the pistol in his belt, and then he sprang for the chains. With a mad leap he reached them and hauled himself up. The shrouds came into his hands, his feet found the rattlings beneath them, and he began to climb. As his head cleared the bulwark, he could see, the de he could see on deck the flash of a pistol shot, illuminating the scene momentarily, fixing the struggle on the deck below in a static moment, much like a picture. Before and below him a British seaman was fighting a furious cutlass duel with a French officer, and he realised with vague astonishment that the kettle-mending noises he had just heard was the sound of cutlass on cutlass, that clash of steel against steel that the poets wrote about. So much for romance. The realisation carried him far up the shrouds, at his elbow, he felt the photic shrouds, and he transferred himself to them, hanging back downward with his toes hooked on the rattlings, and his hands clinging like death. That only lasted for two or three desperate seconds, and then he hauled himself on to the topmost shrouds, and began the final ascent, his lungs bursting with the effort. Here was the topsail yard, and Hornblower flung himself across it, and felt with his feet for the foot rope. Merciful God! There was no foot rope. His feet, searching in the darkness, met only unresisting air. A hundred feet above the deck he hung, squirming and kicking like a baby held up at arm's length in its father's hands. There was no foot rope. It may have been with this very situation in mind that the Frenchman had removed it. There was no foot rope, so that he could not make his way out to the yard arm. Yet the gaskets must be cast off and the sail loosened. Everything depended on that. Hornblower had seen the daredevil seaman run out along the yard standing upright, as though walking a tightrope. That was the only way to reach the yard arm now. For a moment he could not breathe, as his weak flesh revolted against the thoughts of walking along that yard above the black abyss. This was his fear. The fear that stripped a man of his manhood, turning his bowels to water and his limbs to paper. Yet his furious active mind continued to work. He'd been resolute enough in dealing with Hales. 
Where he was personally not involved, he had been brave, he had been brave enough. He had not hesitated to strike down the wretched epileptic with all the strength of his arm. That was the sort of poor courage he was capable of displaying. In the simple vulgar matter of physical bravery, he was utterly wanting. This was cowardice, the sort of thing that men spoke about behind their hands to other men. He could not bear the thought of that in himself. It was worse, awful though the alternative might be, than the thought of falling through the night into the deck. With a gasp, he brought his knee up onto the yard, heaving himself up until he stood upright. He felt the rounded, canvas-covered timber under his feet, and his instincts told him not to dally there for a moment. Come on, men! he yelled, and dashed out along the yard. It was twenty feet to the yard arm, and he covered the distance in a few frantic strides. Utterly reckless by now, he put his hands down on the yard, clasped it, and laid his body across it, his hands seeking the gaskets. A thump on the yard told him that Oldroyd, who had been detailed to come after him, had followed him out along the, uh, along the yard. He had six feet less to go. There could be no doubt now that the other members of the Jolly Boat's crew were on the yard, and the clough had led, had led the way to the starboard yard arm. It was obvious from the rapidity with which the sail came loose. Here was the brace beside him, without any thought of danger now, for he was delirious with excitement and triumph. He grasped it with both hands and jerked himself off the yard. His waving legs found the rope and twined about it, and he let himself slide down. Fool that he was! Would he never learn sense and prudence? Would he never remember that vigilance and precaution must never be relaxed? He had allowed himself to slide so fast that the rope seared his hands, and when he tried to tighten his grip as to slow down, his progress had caused him such agony that he had to relax it again and slide down on the rope, stripping the skin from his hands as though peeling off a glove. His feet reached the deck, and he momentarily forgot the pain as he looked round him. There was the faintest grey light beginning to show now, and there were no sounds of battle. It had been a well-worked surprise. A hundred men flung suddenly on the deck of the corvette had swept away the anchor watch and mastered the vessel in a single rush before the watch below could come up to offer any resistance. Chad's stentorian voice came peeling from the, fork, from the forecastle. Cable's cut, sir. Then Eccles bellowed from aft. Mr. Hornblower! Sir, yelled Hornblower. Man the halyards! A rush of men came to help, not only his own boat's crew, but every man of initiative and spirits. Halli halyard sheets and braces, the sail was trimmed round and was drawn full in the light southerly air, and the papillon swung round to go down the first of the ebb. Dawn was coming up fast, with a trifle of mist on the surface of the water. Over the starboard quarter, a sullen, bellowing roar, and then the misty air was torn by a series of infernal screams, supernaturally loud. The first cannonballs Hornblower had ever heard were passing him by. Mr. Chad, set the headsails, loose the fore topsail, get aloft some of you and set the mizzen topsail. From the bow, from the port bow came another salvo. Blay was firing at them from one side, Sandy from the other, and now they could guess what had happened on board the Papillon. But the corvette was moving fast with the wind and tide, and it would be no easy matter to cripple her in the half-light. It had been a very near-run thing. A few seconds' delay could have been fatal. Only one shot from the next salvo passed within hearing, and its passage was marked by a loud snap overhead. Mr. Mallory, get that forced day spliced! Aye, aye, sir! It was light enough to look round the deck now. He could see Eccles at the break of the poop, directing the handling of the corvette, and Soames beside the wheel, conning her down the channel. Two groups of red-coated marines with bayonets fixed stood guard over the hatchways. There were four or five men lying on the deck in curiously abandoned attitudes. Dead men. Hornblower could look at them with the callousness of youth, but there was a wounded man too, crouched groaning over his shattered thigh. Hornblower could not look at him as disinterestedly, and he was glad, maybe for his own sake, when at that moment a seaman asked for and received permission from Mallory to leave his duties and attend to him. Stand by to go about, shouted Eccles from the poop. The corvette had reached the tip of the middle ground shoal and was about to make the turn that would carry her into open sea. The men came running to the braces and Hornblower tailed on along with them. But the first contact of that harsh, harsh rope gave him such pain that he almost cried out. His hands were like raw meat and fresh killed at that. For blood was running from them. Now that his attention was called to them, they smarted unbearably. The head, sh the head sill sheets came over, and the corvette went handily about. There's the old Indy, shouted somebody. 
The indefatigable was plainly visible now, lying to just out of shot range from the shore batteries, ready to rendezvous with our prize. Somebody cheered, and the cheering was taken up by everyone, even while the last shots from Saint D fired at extreme range, pitched sullenly into the water alongside. Hornblower had gingerly extracted his handkerchief from his pocket and was trying to wrap it round his hand. Can I help you with that, sir? asked Jackson. Jackson shook his head as he looked at the raw surface. He was careless, sir. You ought to have gone a down, o a down and over, he said, when Hornblower explained to him how the injury had been caused. Very careless you was, sir, begging your pardon for saying so, sir. But you young gentlemen often is. You don't have no thought for your necks, nor your eyes, sir. Hornblower looked up at the main topsail yard, high above his head, and remembered how he had walked along that slender stick of timber out to the yard arm in the dark. At the recollection of it, even here with the solid deck under his feet, he shuddered a little. Sorry, sir, didn't mean to hurt you, said Jackson, tying the knot. There, that's done as good as I can get it, sir. Thank you, Jackson, said Hornblower. We got to, re we got to report the jolly boat as lost, sir, went, uh, said, went on Jackson. Lost? She ain't towing alongside, sir. You see, we didn't leave no boat keeper in her. Well, Z was to be the boat keeper, you remember that, sir. But I sent him up the ring and go, go ahead of me, seeing that. Ailes couldn't go. We were too many for the job, sir. So the jolly boat must have come, ar come adrift, sir, when the ship went about. What about Hales, then? asked Hornblower. He was still in the jolly boat, sir. Hornblower looked back up the estuary of the Gironde. Somewhere up there, the jolly boat was drifting about, and lying in it was Hales, probably dead possibly alive. In either case, the French would find him, surely enough. But a cold wave of regret extinguished the warm feeling of triumph in Hornblower's bosom when he thought about Hales back there. If it had not been for Hales, he would never have nerved himself, or so at least he thought, to run out to the main topsail yardarm. He would at this moment be ruined and branded as a coward instead of basking in the satisfaction of having capably done his duty. Jackson saw the bleak look in his face. Don't you take on so, sir. They won't hold load the loss of the jolly boat again, you. Not the captain and Mr. Eccles, they won't. I wasn't thinking about the jolly boat, said Hornblower. I was thinking about Hales. Oh, him, said Jackson. Don't you fret about him, sir. He wouldn't never have made no seaman, not know how.